Now, if I may have your attention, I would like to introduce Richard Howard, a professor in the writing division in the School of Art at Columbia University. Richard Howard is a Pulitzer Prize winning poet and translator of French literature. His prodigious list of translations includes the writing of Stendhal, André Gide, Charles de Gaulle, Roland Barthes, and Alain Rogrier. And he also is the translator of poetry, the poetry of Baudelaire, Saint-Jean de Perse, and others. His translation of Baudelaire's Fleur de Mal won him the American Book Award in 1970. Mr. Howard is the author of 15 volumes of verse written over a period of 40 to 50 years the recipient of numerous highly prestigious prizes and fellowships. He counts among his many honors a MacArthur Fellowship. I met Mr. Howard at a dinner some years ago before reading his wonderful translations of the letters of Bonnard and Matisse. Those letters share a very private dialogue between two great friends, two extraordinary artists. When I asked Mr. Howard to read the letters for the exhibition's audio guide, he agreed without hesitation and brought along some of his own verse. The audio guide is richly rewarded by Mr. Howard's resonant voice, as you will be today by the recitation of his poetry for Bonar. I'm going, <clears throat> I'm going to read three poems. <coughs> Two of them concern Bonar, but I, I thought it would be wise to begin with a poem uh, that was about another painter altogether, although a painting, a painter of a painting in this museum. And uh, I wanted to uh, switch a little bit away from painting uh, to deal, to remind you that there is also poetry. And uh, my poem, the first poem, is a, a kind of letter to the great Greek poet, Constantine Kavafi, who died in 1936. At 20, implausible age as we now visualize you, <clears throat> but you were 20 once. You found in the Revue des Deux Mondes oh, not even a reproduction, but, but was, what must have impressed you as a stimulatingly detailed, though somewhat disrespectful account of Gustave Moreau's Oedipus and the Sphinx. In its season, the scandal of the Salon and ever since a source of dismay. Yet you were moved to rehearse the tale in the all too plausible verses of your juvenilia, now consigned to the implacable purgatory of rejected poems. Although this particular confrontation gorgeously limbed the year you were born by a young man who like you would live with his mother till she died must altogether have seduced you as young Moreau envisioned it, or as you divined that vision from some ambitious feuilleton merely describing it, nonetheless, the fabled heroic encounter failed to lure you into its clutches ever again. There would be no future Kavafi transactions with this early Oedipal matter. Regardless of all the beautiful young men, hardly heroes, no often in like undress, who took starring or supporting roles in your epic memory. But of course, if you had seen the canvas as I have here in New York City where it enjoys, you know, endures, pride of place in our great museum's symbolist freak show, Minus the insolent elucidation of some hebdomadal hack, you might have been motivated to produce canonical Kavafi rather than rejected verse. Why not an Oedipus cycle, as copious as your 
Julie and the Apostate poems, you never had much use for French modern wits. Preferring to get the news from old farts and fogies like Anatole France, Heredia, Barres. Unfortunately, it was the new guys, Cocteau and company, how you'd have despised ces messieurs, who were now dispensing plays, poems, and theories on Oedipus, as Gide, one of them, remarked, a veritable Oedipemic. <laughs> but to all such contagion you were immune, inspired by some wags' verbose variations on the theme of semi-porn bric-a-brac. I wonder. Moreau's Wasteland, my turn now. I'm looking right at it. A full-color postcard pervaded by the Metropolitan is riddled, as the saying goes, with partially eaten corpses of previous contenders, whom the Sphinx, to put it nakedly, had stumped. Did you get that much? And from the review's coverage, could you ever get the whole picture? Could you see that this lynx girl, man-eater, the human flesh of her one visible breast, as adamantine as the hero's thigh she perches on, has clawed away most of his sea green mantle to gain a more intimate purchase, if not an actual embrace, than at least an uninvited, unresisted eyeball to eyeball stare. Why? Has she already put a rather childish question? Or has he just made his famous and really infantile reply? What has the Sphinx done or failed to do to him? What will he do to her? Does she seek her fate in his eyes? In hers, he sees the eager desire he knows he can slake, as he could Jocasta's, whose very crown has he realized. This cormorant-winged killer also wears at first, you might have been disappointed by that rosy little face, anything but the physiognomy of fate. And then, could you have made out what her tail is clearly pointing to? On the bare rock just beneath her is a heap of, uh, of deep sphinx doo-doo, which Moreau has rendered as a handful of glowing gems the comprehensible outcome of the beast's incontinent outrage at receiving the right answer. And you, you surmise some dungy event, sphingle and sphincteral, had occurred for your rejected poem is quite explicit. Yet he takes no pleasure in his victory. Whose gaudy journalism told you that? According to the Revue des Deux Mondes, Théophile Gautier himself had conceded he was not displeased by how much Hamlet there seemed to be in the naked prince. Was that your clue to write? His gaze fills with sadness. He is blind to the Sphinx but sees the narrow road that goes to Thebes and comes to its end in Colonus. Could you have read such things in some art critic's gloss on Moreau's grisly critique, oh, erotique? I don't believe it. Dear Constantine, if I may, even by this rejected poem you had fulfilled the Moreau you never saw. Never mind his amiable explicator whom you happened to read. And when you came to write those last lines about your naked prince, and in his soul there is a clear foreboding that there the Sphinx will speak to him again with much more difficult and far greater riddles that have no answer. You were looking far enough ahead to see what poems you could reject in favor of those to be written once you had been purged 
of your beginnings, the poems of no myth or method, but of reality, which is a human imagination of all we know to be inhuman. I'm not allowed to turn it off. <laughs> Thank you. And now, now for my poems about Bonard. One, the first one was based on uh, that show that both Julian and uh, Vita have talked about the first big Monard show after his death at the Museum of Modern Art in 1947 or 8. And uh, I must say I was very confused by Monard when I, I was, I was uh, uh, hunting for modernism in those days. And I was confused and yet um, beguiled. And uh, I wrote a poem much, much later, called Bonard, a novel, uh, which, uh, in a sense, tried to come to some kind of poetic terms uh, with what I had seen uh, so immensely. Bonard, a novel, the tea party at Le Canet. Just as we arrived, it began a downpour and kept on. This might have been the time before. Charles Xavier playing Scriab in etudes. All the others at the open window. A landscape, <laughs> lawn, <coughs> garden, stro strawberry patch. Japanese footbridge, barges moving on the river beyond. As in Verlaine, beyond a mist of rain and the regular noise of the rain on tens of thousands of leaves. Such is the prose that wears the poem's guise at last. White cats, one in almost every chair, pretend not to be watching young Jean worry the dog. Sophie, damp, dashes in, disheveled from the forest, dumping out a great bag of morals on the table. The white cloth will surely be spoiled. But the mushrooms look iridescent, like newly opened oysters in the rain-dark air, blue by this light. Calling it accidental is only declaring that it exists. And then tea downstairs, Jean opening the round pantry window, and the smell of wet soil and strawberries with our cinnamon toast, all perception is a kind of sorting out one green from another, parting leaf from leaf. But in the afternoon rain, signs and shadows only, the separate life renounced until, until that resignation comes in which all selfhood surrenders. Upstairs, more Scriabin and the perfect gestures of Sophie and Jean playing ball with the dog, all the cats are deaf. Steady rain, the music continues, Charles Xavier shouting over the notes, ignoring them. Beatitude teaches nothing. To live without happiness and not wither, there's an occupation, almost a profession. Take the trees. We could contrive to do without trees, but not leaves. Charles Xavier explains from the piano still playing. We require leaves, their decorous decorum that is one of congestion, till, till like Shelley, we become lewd vegetarians. Apprehensive about the rain, I ask Jean to order a closed carriage for Simone. The doctor frowns, a regular visitor these days and frightens her, eyeing Sophie's mushrooms, his diagnosis, toadstools. Scriabin diminishes. Is the dog lost? 
Jean rushes, rushes outside, punishment of the dog, he's forbidden the strawberry patch. Darker now. One candle is found for the piano, and the music resumes with Debussy, a little sphere of yellow in the sopping dusk. The river's surface looks, is it the rain? Like the sea in shallows, this moment is an instant instance of the world becoming a mere convenience, more or less credible. And the old questions rise to our lips, but have we spoken a word? Before we remember, prompted by the weather probably, or the time of day, that we already know something. We are not newborn then. What is it that we know? The carriage comes at last, but it is an open carriage, merely hooded. We crowd under, fending off the last drops with a violet golf umbrella that Charles Xavier has somehow managed for us. A slow, cold drive under the trees. Simone balancing the suspect mushrooms in her lap. I tell her it is not dangerous, we cannot die but are in this light or lack of it. Trees dripping, the sky fraudulent, much less individuals than we hope or fear to be. <laughs> Once home, we shall have a little supper of Sophie's fresh-picked morals. And uh, the, the <clears throat> main uh, piece, uh, which comes out of many years of looking at Bonnard and is much more, uh, uh, he speaks in this poem throughout, uh, although we hear another voice, the voice of his dealer's widow. The time is the Second World War, about 1943, uh, just after Mart's death. And, uh, Bonar speaks, but we hear the voice of his dealer uh, concern during the occupation. The poem is called Occupations. Uh, during the occupation to sell the paintings that she, her husband, late husband, has always sold by Bonard. And now she's concerned to sell them to Reichsmarschall Hermann Goering. She speaks first. Well, of course, we're still using the old stationery. Who can find paper these days? <laughs> but as you see, the lettering outside has already been uh, changed. And to all intents and purposes, this is now the gallery Million. I, I was Mathilde Million before the late Monsieur Bernheim married me. And I believe the Rice Marshal will find that nothing shows him, shown him, is on the list of proscribed artists. May I, may I call your attention to these? No, no, not the very recent things. Anything begun since 1942, I find a bit too stiff. No doubt the rigidity of an intimated end. <laughs> Uh, but a choice among the later canvases, my dear Reichs Marshal. After all, the man is well into his 70s, and we, we may call anything done in the last decade a late work, wouldn't you say? Though the gallery has represented Bonnard since, oh my goodness, since before my marriage, these paintings have just reached us. The old fellow keeps them ever so long in his studio down there at Le Canet, endlessly reworking what I feel to be the lessons he has learned, you see, you see here, 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 and over here, particularly from his friend Matisse. Eight January, 42, Le Canet. Dear Matisse, I have sad news. Marthe has died of what she called her immortal disease. 
First the lungs were attacked and then the digestive tract and yet she managed to survive each new one, each onset for all the pain she must have been suffering until the last, just six, a day, six days ago. The heart gave out. We laid her to rest in the graveyard I can see from upstairs at Le Bosque. A comfort to me, knowing she is there. I think you recall the strange delusion. <laughs> unclean, that unclean, which kept her so many hours immersed in the bath. We made it a joke between us, very nearly a joke, enough of one for me to paint her there. How many times? A modern naiad, huh? Or as Monet would have said, a nenuphar. <laughs> Our little ceremony for Marthe brought back the time, can it be 20 years, when Vuillard and I and old Clemenceau laid Monet to rest. <laughs> so much of life is buried already. Just consider, dear Reich Marshal, this delightful view of a mimosa tree from the studio window, for example. It was begun in 1939, along with other momentous enterprises, if I may say so, and not finished, though what works by this painter can ever be called finished. Not released, then, until only a few weeks ago, when the old fellow himself had the canvas sent to me directly. We may sell it along with these others. Thank goodness he is exempt from the doctrinal tests, though like Matisse and Dufy, not considered meritorious. All the same, I still believe in reality the way Cezanne believed in it. I believe in repetition, that is. And I am at work on some new views of the bay. They must be new, because every day I see different things, or I see things differently. In the sky, the fields, the water beyond. It all keeps changing. You could drown in the differences. Yet that is just what keeps us alive, no? Despite our bad skies, how the spring responds. Daily, on my walk, some new species of flower appears, as if each one were having its turn. This morning, the first almond blossoms, like proclamations attached to the bare trees. A kind of, of bravery, I can't help thinking. And soon the mimosas will begin to set yellow pennants in the woods as if it was a signal. Of course, everything begins on the ground and moves up, but I see things best against the light. I can let you have such work in lots at a most attractive, attractive rate for the whole group here in the gallery, amusing by the way. That barely perceptible woman's face down there on the left, yeah, yes, at the very bottom, almost drowned out by the light. She's looking up the stairs toward the painter, not out the window at all, where the mimosa suffuses the whole picture with gold, filling the window so that it has something of the appearance of stained glass. The horizon lies much lower in my landscapes than it ever did before. You know, at our age, we tend, except for P, of course, who is hardly one of us, to be more interested in objects than in the construction of the universe. These encroachments, these occupations by disease, by sorrow, by the Germans, come in great waves, you know what I mean, that thing old Rodin always used to say about how it takes an exceptional array of circumstances to grant a man 70 years of life and the luck to keep doing what he loves. All the waves come, they keep coming over us, 
And though we may be nearly drowned, they leave us just where we were. And we know that if they are strong, we are even stronger. For they pass and we remain. <laughs> Old Rodin, what insolence. <laughs> My calling him that. We are both much older than he lived to be, pontificating in front of the gates of hell. Remember those afternoons in the Rue de Varennes, lecturing overdressed women in his garden? Did you ever believe we would be that old? Such a pleasure, my dear Rice Marshal. Indeed, a privilege to be able to offer these canvases for actual purpose. Purchase. Only last May, you know, we were obliged to destroy in the courtyard of the Louvre some 500 pictures by Masson, Leger, poor old Kiesling, even Picasso, real horrors, all canvases entirely unfit for sale. The fire went out after the day, and the smoke covered the sky even the next morning. 27 February, dear Matisse, it is not easy keeping abreast of events, nor have I any great longing to know <laughs> what may be happening in the world. I almost said the real world, don't believe that. A few days ago I learned about Joss, how he died. Oh, just his death. All that L'Eclaireur de Nice reports is that he had been ailing over 40 Forty years since Bernheim Jern took me on. You must have come to the gallery soon after, about 1909. What a long time Joss did the one thing. Most people are not conscious enough to exult in monotony. But perhaps God is. Perhaps God says each morning to the moon, encore. I know that's what Joss would say to me whenever a show came down. And today, inside Black Borders, Mathilde Bernheim writes to say she's asking his painters to testify. You must have had the same letter. Hmm. To what Joss has accomplished for independent French heart. She thinks this will save her family from the persecutions. I, I was glad to write, as you must have been, and Dufy, Rouault, Dera, but to tell the truth, none of this will do the least bit of good. Oh, I'm so happy to know that this lot is passing to such appreciative hands and eyes, of course. Is it not charming, the woman at her toilette, seen as if by accident through the doorway? Oh, wonderful then that in these dark times, the painter could find so much so much light to celebrate, such depths to plumb so brilliantly. Dear Matisse, you know as well as I, the Germans acknowledge a single name among French painters. Our conquerors recognize only our conqueror, if I may put it that way. Perhaps you see Monsieur Picasso as no such thing, Matisse, but I, have textual evidence as to how that Spaniard has seen me. I like him best, your Bonard. He once wrote this to Joss, who of course passed on this good news. When he is not thinking of being a painter, when his canvases are full of literature, this is really what he said, rotten with anecdotes. Did that suffice? Not for our Pablo. Conviler was kind enough to send the latest bulletin, and I am compelled to copy it out here for your edification. One way to exercise, exorcise the curse of the thing, <laughs> or so I hope. What he does is not painting. He never goes beyond his own sensibility. He doesn't know how to choose. Take his sky. First he paints blue, more or less the way, way it looks. Then he 
looks a while longer and sees mauve in it. So he adds a touch or two of mauve, just to be sure. And then he assumes there may be a little pink there too. Why not add some pink? If he looks long enough, he'll wind up adding a little yellow instead of deciding what color the sky really ought to be. Is that painting? No, no, that's taking advice from nature, asking her to supply you with information. Bonard obeys nature, another decadent, the end of an old idea. There you have the words, my dear Matisse, of a fellow artist, a practitioner of the métier we have shared, all of us, for how many years? Is this the man I can ask to speak to Herr Abetz on behalf of Joss Bernheim and of Mathilde Bernheim? If you can do it, I leave it to you. Oh, very well. We shall send the entire shipment to your private car at the Gare de l'Est. Oh, two cars. All the better. And the bill, the bill to the Einsatzstab Rosenberg, no, 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 all these have come to us from the artist himself, not one from other dealers. Graf Metternich was at some pains to stipulate the stock of uh, Zelikman, Wildenstein, Loeb, e tutti quanti, must be transferred to the embassy as a security for eventual peace negotiations. I, I understand perfectly. After yesterday, I belong once more to the human race. A trial, remember. A trial. I am but a member still, all because they've decided to operate. The surgeon has bestowed civil status, even a country, on me. My country is the hospital. And I am Dr. A's patient in room 14 on whom Dr. B will operate. The corridor where I walk and wait and write this to you is my realm. No one dreams of disputing the territory. I see other men and women too who have been operated on or brought back on their gurneys. The surgeons, interns and nurses clustering round them like white flies. Through their doors, I can hear the groans those patients make, even in their sleep. The same groans I shall make when it is my turn. The nurses know me, and I know them. One comes for temperature, one for blood, and another with pills. The pill nurse is pretty, and the rest are young. When I walk past their glassed-in booth, I always hear them talking about us, their patients, theirs. And for the first time in a long while, I find humanity better than I had supposed. And now I can more easily regard my own death, which no longer divides me from the world. It is possible, nothing more. It becomes a simple statistic. In rooms off this corridor, a percentage of patients must die, and in this percentage is what they attempt to reduce. Each nurse in this wing will regard my death as her failure. The one who looks like Danielle Darrier's daughter says, after each deceased, she won't sleep for a week. <laughs> my death no longer exposes me to the living. That is why I have made my will so easily and told my notary where to find the pictures I had hidden so long. I have forgotten nothing. It seems only fair to meet with an attentive precision, the same precision they devote to my file, from which no x-ray, blood analysis, or fever chart is missing. I want to present the anesthesiologist with a man according to rules. But once you obey the rules, there is nothing left to do but wait. And I wait, I wait, and I look for what it could mean, this death of mine that seems so near. I admit it will be nothing, otherwise death is not death, and even one's thoughts about it are just playing with words. And without my body, what is left of me? 
Hmm. No reading the paper, no talk with the doctor making rounds, no action of any kind. But do I make these actions I assume I'm making now? It is my newspaper, printed in an edition of thousands, that puts pressure on me to read it. The doctor comes when he feels like coming, evades my questions, departs, that is my freedom, which is nothing but my uncertainty about what is going to happen next. Of course, that is my freedom, but having been introduced into this vast machinery, I am not even sure such uncertainty as to my fate is part and parcel of my life. My death is not enough to dispel it. No doubt I am the total of my memories and nothing else, that huge collection of gathered by my life and dispersed by my death. But so many of these memories I see now, they don't belong to me. What did I do that was mine? I went to the parish school, served out my term in the infantry, and I was not alone. In each photograph I belonged to a group and someone must draw a little cross over my head if I am to be identified. Dear Matisse, nothing is there. What remains is the almond tree I was working on the morning I came to the hospital. Pray God it will be there still if I'm allowed to go home. Well, of course, we have carefully weeded out all the identifiable portraits in the Bonard lot there were a number of studies of my late husband and his family and friends. They were obliged to join the others in those requisitioned rooms in the Louvre, where, as you know, they were slashed to ribbons by members of the Einstadtstaat themselves. A regrettable procedure, but apparently a necessary one. You know, my dear Reich Marshal, we French have an old poem, which I always like to recite at times like these. I claim the right to act as if the war were an old dog sitting at the lovely feet of our friends.